Crash safety is a major issue in the 90s. Vehicle structures are now stronger, so they're able to pass the stringent offset crash tests which will soon become mandatory. But it's not only those cars that are perceived as safe that are benefiting from new technology. Almost every new model now has a standard fitment, seat belt grabbers, seat belt pretensioners, and most importantly, a steering wheel airbag with the option of a passenger side airbag. Airbags are often referred to as supplementary restraint systems, or SRS. All these new safety features are designed to complement but not replace the primary restraint system, the seat belt. This is the most important and effective element of a car's occupant restraint system. Seat belt webbing is designed to stretch slightly in an impact to allow an occupant's forward movement to be reduced gradually without the belt causing injury. However, a typical 30 miles per hour collision can see a normal seat belt stretch by 10 percent and the belt unwind from the inertia reel mechanism by some 75 millimeters before locking. This is enough for an occupant to hit the steering wheel or dashboard. In the 19 to 31 miles per hour speed range, some 30 percent of belted drivers receive injuries and this figure rises to 70 percent or more at higher speeds. Belt grabbers, pretensioners and airbags can greatly reduce injuries. However, they can offer pitfalls to the unwary repairer. This program offers advice to help overcome any such pitfalls. The emergency services should of course follow their own guidelines. An airbag is a large protective cushion, normally a nylon bag, which inflates incredibly quickly from the steering wheel to protect the head and upper body of the occupant in a severe frontal crash. General Motors began developing the airbag in 1967 and they're now in widespread use throughout the United States. In Britain, Ford's Mondeo was one of the first mass-produced cars to have an airbag fitted as standard, along with Vauxhall's Cavalier. These cars illustrate the two sizes of airbag available. The full size or US bag is large with an inflated gas capacity of some 50 to 80 liters. Its size is dictated by the American market where seat belt usage is not always observed. But for the European market, the bag has been redesigned for use in conjunction with the seat belt. The Euro bag, as fitted to Ford's Mondeo, was originally designed for a driver wearing a seat belt. Therefore, it's smaller, with a capacity of 30 to 45 litres. Passenger side airbags usually deploy from the upper glove box area of the dashboard, so the bag must be larger to cope with the greater distance between the occupant and the deployment point of the bag. Passenger side Euro bags are of 60 to 90 litres in capacity whilst the US bags have a capacity of up to 160 litres. Airbags only deploy in frontal impacts, either head-on or offset. The airbag will not deploy in cases of side, rear or rollover impact. A larger airbag isn't necessarily safer. Airbags are designed for each specific model, taking into account a variety of factors to maximise the efficiency of the individual system. Airbags are designed to inflate incredibly quickly. Depending upon the speed of impact, bag inflation is over in some 30 milliseconds, or 0 0.03 of a second, less time than it takes to blink. Airbags are inflated by igniting with an electrical charge a solid gas propellant, usually either sodium azide or nitrocellulose. G-level crash sensors are used to trigger the airbag. There are three principal types of sensor, mechanical, electronic, or more usually a combined electromechanical unit. Most manufacturers fit an electronic control unit that contains these crash sensors, like the one mounted under the steering column of the Mondeo, or this one between the seats of the Cavalier. The electronic control unit, or ECU, on this BMW is mounted in the steering wheel with the airbag. However, some manufacturers mount the crash sensors on the chassis legs separate from the ECU, like on this Saab. The typical combined electromechanical control unit usually contains two separate sensors, an electronic crash sensor measuring deceleration 
and an electromechanical safing sensor. The electronic crash sensor detects deceleration beyond specific stored values. The electromechanical safing sensor is a G-switch which will close on deceleration. Only if both sensors fire simultaneously will the control unit send out the necessary signal for the bag to actuate. These dual safety circuits reduce the possibility of accidental firing in minor impacts or when driving over a rough road surface. The threshold speed for an airbag to deploy in an impact is usually 12 to 20 miles per hour. But this is of course dependent on the impact situation. So let's take a closer look at how an airbag system works in a crash situation. Looking at the 45 litre self-contained unit fitted to the Rover 600. At the moment of impact, known as time zero, the deceleration of the vehicle causes the crash sensor and electromechanical spring contact switch to close. At the same time, the electromechanical safing sensor has also closed, confirming the vehicle is in a crash situation. Both sensors will close at precisely the right time for optimum bag deployment. This has taken just 15 milliseconds. A current is then allowed to flow into the inflator, igniting the propellant, which in this case is sodium azide. This burns rapidly, producing nitrogen gas to inflate the bag at high pressure. At 20 milliseconds, the gas causes the folded bag to inflate rapidly, ripping the steering wheel cover at its predetermined split lines. The bag inflates at precisely the right moment to cushion the occupant's head as it's thrown forward. At 45 milliseconds, the bag is fully inflated. At 90 milliseconds, the cushioning effect is causing the bag to deflate through vent holes, absorbing the energy of the impact. By 150 milliseconds, the airbag is fully deflated and the occupant has recoiled back, supported by the seat and headrest. The impact is all over in the time it takes you just to blink. Seat belts have also seen recent changes that improve their efficiency further. Seat belt pretensioners and belt grabbers are both designed to improve crash safety by ensuring optimum occupant restraint. In an impact, conventional seat belts can allow up to 75 millimeters of the belt to spool out from the reel. Belt grabbers are designed to limit this spooling effect by locking the seat belt. The locking mechanism works within 5 milliseconds, activating clamps on the belt to restrict spool out by 15 millimeters. Although belt systems must always be checked after minor impacts, belt grabbers reset automatically. Seat belt pretensioners are more sophisticated. In a collision, sensors operate either a mechanical or a pyrotechnic unit, which rapidly tightens the belt webbing, removing any slack from clothes or the belt, thus ensuring optimum occupant restraint. There are three types of pretensioner systems. Renault use pyrotechnic buckle-mounted units controlled by an ECU. These operate an explosive charge which activates a steel cable, pulling the buckle downwards by 60 millimeters. Vauxhall use mechanical buckle units. These operate in a similar way, but have a spring-loaded mass sensor to pull the buckle down. Both these types are installed on the seat frame. Mercedes use pyrotechnic pretensioners, but these are integral with the belt reel mounted in the B-post. When activated, these wind the belt back onto the reel by 60 millimeters in just 12 milliseconds. Belt tensioners are constantly in an active state, although systems installed in the seat are disabled automatically during seat adjustment. They work independently of the airbag mechanism at impact speeds in excess of 8 miles per hour. So how do these new safety devices affect the body shop? How do you recognize an airbag or a belt pretensioner? What precautions should be taken when such a vehicle enters your workshop or you're estimating for a repair? 
Vehicles equipped with airbags, pretensioners and belt grabbers, sometimes known as web lockers, became commonplace by 1994 model year as safety awareness increased. Such vehicles normally have warning labels under the bonnet, on the sun visor, on the glove box or on the VIN plate to indicate what items are fitted. Airbag equipped cars often show the letters SRS or airbag on the steering wheel cover and if fitted on the passenger side of the dashboard. Pretensioner mechanisms are sometimes indicated on the seat belt units. Reference to the relevant Thatcher methods manual or the car's handbook will illustrate where such equipment is fitted. An actuated airbag is obvious, a limp white bag hanging from the torn wheel boss. Around the inside of the vehicle there may be some talc-like white powder which lubricates the airbag during inflation. Although not dangerous, care should be taken to avoid getting this powder into the eyes or mouth as it may cause irritation. It's advisable for workshop technicians to wear gloves when handling deployed airbags. Pretensioners sometimes show a warning label around the belt buckle, like the warning flag fitted to Vauxhall's body lock system to show that it's been activated. On buckle mounted systems, the seat belt buckle will have retracted into the mechanism. On real mounted pretensioners, the belt will often be immovable. Airbags and pretensioners which have activated will both require replacement and repair technicians should follow the manufacturer's instructions. Additionally, the operation and condition of the entire belt system should be carefully checked. After severe frontal impacts, the whole belt system, including the retractors and grabbers, should be changed. Problems can also arise when working on a damaged vehicle if such systems haven't fired. It is inevitable that a vehicle in a workshop will be put through violent shocks, be trimmed and detrimmed, have electrical circuits disconnected and reconnected, and be subjected to extremes of heat. All, of course, correct working procedures and all conditions that can cause the accidental deployment of SRS mechanisms. So use caution. Never attempt to make airbag systems safe just by removing a connector. An arcing contact might cause accidental inflation. On all vehicles with electronically controlled systems, the battery must be disconnected from both terminals before working. This is of course standard body shop practice. It is not sufficient just to switch off the ignition because the system will still be active. Sharp knocks to the vehicle, pulling and welding, may damage the airbag and control units, so they must also have been disconnected, although it's not usually necessary to remove these items, except when carrying out such work in their immediate vicinity. Airbag modules should not be heated unduly. However, baking cars in an oven should present no difficulty, although at temperatures above 90 degrees Celsius, there is the possibility of accidental deployment. After battery disconnection, the vehicle must then be left for up to 30 minutes to allow any reserve energy stored in the ECU capacitors to be discharged. The capacitors allow the airbag to fire even after the battery has been destroyed in a heavy impact. Manufacturers stipulate different discharge times for their backup power systems, from 1 to 30 minutes. If in doubt, leave the vehicle for the full 30 minutes. It's also important to be aware of any disabling devices that might be built into the unit which must be engaged to make it safe and facilitate removal. For example, Honda used two different systems depending on the model. The NSX and Legend have a shorting connector behind the access lid. Whereas the Accord and the Civic require one of the mounting bolts to be extracted to disarm the module. 
In both cases, the battery must first, of course, have been disconnected. On this Jaguar XJS, there's a mechanical airbag system similar to those on some Fiats and Toyotas. The unit is totally self-contained with the crash sensors built in. Remember, battery disconnection will not make a mechanical airbag safe because there is no electrical current present. Jaguar service a special tool which must be used to disarm and remove the airbag. Once the tool is inserted into the module and the arming pin is deactivated, the unit is then removable and safe to handle. This tool must also be used to disarm the unit when removing the steering wheel. Pretensioners also need disarming prior to major vehicle work. On pyrotechnic systems, the battery must be disconnected and the capacitors allowed time to discharge before unplugging. For mechanical systems, there are often devices carried on the unit, like the Vauxhall Body Lock Disarmer, or this one for the Mondio. Alternatively, they may be fabricated like the tubing used here. Crash sensors not contained in the ECU should always be disconnected prior to removal and securely refitted before reconnection. These operations should again be carried out with the battery disconnected. Never attempt to repair the airbag module or ECU. Airbags cannot be repacked or in any way reused. After deployment, the control unit crash sensors and airbag module must be replaced together with the wiring loom if damaged. Caution should also be used on reconnecting as a power surge could cause accidental ignition. So make sure there's no one working in the vehicle. Electricians must take care when testing electrical circuits because even the small amount of current in a multimeter could be enough to fire airbags or pretensioners. It's important to be aware that all SRS wiring is colored yellow and aftermarket equipment, such as phones or stereos, should never be connected to the airbag circuits. When switching on the ignition after reconnection, most electronic control units will run self-diagnostic checks, any fault being indicated by a warning lamp on the dashboard. This telltale lamp will usually glow when the ignition is turned on but will quickly extinguish to indicate a correctly functioning airbag. If this light illuminates permanently or flashes after this period, a fault has been found with the system. Airbags can sometimes be retrofitted to cars not originally equipped, like some BMWs and Volkswagens, for example. A new steering wheel containing the ECU may also need to be fitted. These units are self-contained and include this telltale light. Vehicles with mechanical systems, like this Jaguar, don't tend to have a diagnostic circuit or a light. Sometimes tools are available from the vehicle manufacturer to check the system. And in some cases, these tools must be used to reset the system after replacement. It might be necessary to have this operation carried out by a member of the dealer network if tools are not available. When carrying a module, ensure that the unit is face up, away from the body. Never place the module or steering column face down or in such a way that accidental deployment would harm anyone. When working on an undeployed airbag system, Never work in the path of the bag, in case it should deploy accidentally. Other workshop staff in the immediate area should be aware of the possibility of accidental deployment. This is, however, very unlikely. As both airbags and pyrotechnically operated pretensioners are in effect small explosive devices, 
they must be stored in accordance with the Explosives Act and should be handled with care as they could cause personal injury. Companies wishing to handle and store these items must register under this Act and re-register annually. As part of our business, we'll be removing airbags from vehicles that have not been deployed. We'll also be storing these airbags, and I believe we will... Contact with the local Trading Standards Office or Fire Service should assist your business to register, if necessary. The Act requires these items to be stored in a locked metal container when not fitted to a vehicle, and all movements logged. Companies must know where their airbags are and how many they have. As some airbags are self-contained, inclusive of detonators and actuating circuits, take care when handling them. Dropping the bag could, in extreme circumstances, cause detonation. Any airbag or ECU dropped should not be reused. They should be returned to the manufacturer in the containers in which they were supplied. Bags should be stored face up in case of accidental operation. Most units are designed to self-inflate at high temperatures, so they must be stored carefully. Airbags do not tend to be held by dealers and are often supplied on an exchange basis. Most airbags have barcodes, so the manufacturer can carefully monitor airbag fitments and deployments. Paperwork recording these details is included with each new unit and must be properly completed. Airbags once installed in cars are considered safe and so the Explosives Act no longer applies. If an airbag equipped vehicle is to be scrapped, the airbag should be deployed by a trained operator to make it safe. Vehicle manufacturers supply specific instructions and tools for this purpose. Again, reference to manufacturers' data is very important. To recap then, airbags and pretensioners are generally safe. They are, after all, designed to save lives. But precautions must be followed. Remember, always adhere to the manufacturer's instructions. Disconnect the battery and, if in doubt, leave for at least 30 minutes for the capacitors to discharge before beginning work. Use the correct deactivation tools, and remember, these must be used to disarm fully mechanical units. Reference to Thatcham's literature on airbags will solve many problems and explain the systems in some detail. Also, Thatcham manuals contain information about which vehicles are fitted with SRS. Our technical helpline can answer specific queries from subscribers. The future will see the widespread fitment of drivers, passengers and door-mounted airbags, together with seatbelt pretensioners. Consequently, this is an important topic for the body repairer to consider. These positive safety features ensure safer roads for the future, whilst reference to Thatcham's data will help keep your body shop safe and up to date. <laughs>